Jovian Space Traffic Control, Polar Orbit of Titan, Saturn. Sir, a massive radiation pulse just occurred near the southern heliosphere section of our solar system. Our best guess estimates it to have a 23 gigaton equivalent. What the fuck? The probe's mission control team, one week after pulse. Probe has breached heliosphere and is beginning to send guidance. Matt was looking through the low FOV camera, aimed directly at the third planet. It had been about a week since the probe exited warp. They had decided to exit a bit far away from the heliosphere area, in case they were off by a tiny amount. But everything had gone well. This far away, it was still impossible to prove anything, and... Hey, car! Look at this! There was a big radiation pulse! Again! And again! It's paused for a few seconds, but it's back! There seems to be about a second between pulses! A small crowd ran over to Met's station. Due to the distance, the image of the planet was only a few pixels wide, but it was flashing in regular intervals. They watched for about a minute before Carr broke the silence. Holy shit! Is this a nuclear war going on? The spectrograph shows signs of fissile decay of uranium. I hope we didn't warp in to witness the death of a civilization we literally just discovered. What the hell is going on? No, I don't think it's a nuclear war. It's too regular for it to be a random attack, and it's been going on for almost two minutes without pause. Maybe that's just how they travel around their system. Maybe they're testing warp like we were. Matt sighed. This is also assuming this isn't some anomalous natural phenomenon. Lest, could you send a, uh, we're sapient signal? Maybe we can get their attention and get some answers. Lest nodded. I'll start with warp pulses consisting of prime numbers, then 20 digits of pi and the root of 2, aimed at all their planets. It should repeat automatically. It might take a few hours for a response if they don't have warp technology, though. If there is intelligent life and they respond, we can send them the atomic masses of the periodic table to establish a baseline. NASA Headquarters, Earth, one week after pulse. It matches the EM spectrum of the anomalous radiation pulse next to Alpha Centauri that SETI picked up five years ago. Pure gamma radiation, but this time with some really exotic particles. Bill, this is almost certainly extraterrestrial life. We should send them a hello signal, Samuel argued. I get that, Sam, but what if they're hostile? We shouldn't give away our positions until we send up a greeting party, or at least have something near them. It had been a very long week. The explosion at what was essentially the solar system's south pole had really kicked humanity into overdrive. Half of Earth and the colonies on Mars, Titan, and Vesta had all suddenly become aware that we may not be alone in this universe. The method of that information being shown to us was not helpful to calm the minds of humanity, and especially the militaries of various groups. Of course, even a massive explosion like that was not dangerous to Earth considering the distance. In fact, it was barely visible to the naked eye if you were stranded on an island in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Still, humanity was torn in a massive debate as to whether it was a warning shot or just the way the aliens propelled themselves. Fine, we let a ship do it. It simplifies things if there's only one unified party doing the talking, and we can still process data here, Samuel finally replied. Using nuclear explosions as a method of propulsion was actively and publicly being developed in order to ship millions of tons of material between the planets within a reasonable amount of time. It was also marketed as a way to decrease the Earth's stockpile of nuclear weaponry without allowing the money spent on making them go to waste. The first ever Orion Drive-powered spacecraft was sitting on the surface of the moon waiting to go on its maiden flight and prove the concept. Using pre-existing mining bases, the metal required to build it was almost entirely sourced from the moon. The hardest part of the entire operation was converting pre-existing nuclear devices into the specialized shaped charges and actually getting them to the moon. You see, nuclear bombs in space are rather less effective than they are on Earth, at least when it comes to transferring kinetic energy to a target. The radiation would still melt your bones from inside you, but the lack of an atmosphere in space means that there is no medium for a pressure wave to travel through. The way we get around that is via a system which first converts hard radiation into thermal heat energy, and that then converts itself into pure kinetic energy due to the intense pressures generated by the heat. This pressure is then channeled directly into a thick tungsten or depleted uranium liner, which gets converted into a hypervelocity plasma jet, which is extremely good at transferring momentum and energy. In a civil use, this then pushes up against a meter or so thick and 30 meter diameter circular plate of steel, which itself is covered in an ablative layer of oil to prevent excessive damage. 
This transfers its momentum through a set of massive pistons connected to the rear of the spaceship in order to lower the peak acceleration to a survivable level. The way the nuke actually gets to the area behind the plate is through a very well-armored gun assembly in the rear of the ship, which shoots the nuke through a hole in the plate. That is an Orion Drive. The system can be weaponized. If you scale it up massively and shape the charge correctly, it forms an extremely tight beam of hypervelocity tungsten plasma, which slowly spreads out like a shotgun and does not stop until it impacts something. Kasaba howitzers are considered WMDs, and only a few have actually been created due to how specific of a situation it would be required to actually be effective. They also conveniently fit into the gun of an Orion Drive. Anyways, shipping the 500 tons of weapons-grade uranium to the moon was THE most tense moment of every government's existence, but the fact that the Lunar Shuttle had major representatives of all of the major powers prevented any incidents. The constructed ship was named Torch. Starting from the top of the ship, the engine is down. The ship's shape consists of a 30-meter diameter and five-story hemispherical tank, with a two-meter gap filled with water, within which is the crew area filled with 100 members. The water acts as radiation shielding against cosmic radiation and as emergency remass for a high-efficiency 1-megawatt arc jet thruster mounted on the top of the ship. Below the crew module itself are four small 500-kilowatt supercritical carbon dioxide nuclear reactors. Mounted radially to the outside of the ship are four large triangular radiators, which reject waste heat from the nuclear reactors while still being within the shadow of the nuclear blast cone. There are also two smaller radiators, which reject heat from the crew next to the arc jet on top of the ship. Below the nuclear reactors is a one-meter-thick steel-cased and supported polyethylene radiation shield, impregnated with beryllium and lithium oxides. Now we get to the nuclear bomb autocannon. This consists of a several-story magazine filled to the brim with low-power nuclear-shaped charges. An automatic loader fills a revolving mechanism with a nuclear device, which gets rotated into position and shot out the back at 50 meters per second with a compressed air charge, where it travels through an opened blast door, past the pusher plate, and then explodes once it reaches the correct distance from the ship. Due to government bureaucracy, the first Orion Drive ever made, of course, had to have a crew of at least 25 people from each of the four major powers to prevent a the drone ship filled with nukes has become a missile situation from occurring. It also didn't really have an initial mission, because nobody could really come to a conclusion as to what a giant nuclear bomb-powered spacecraft's first mission should be. The discovery of alien life changed that. Terran Jovian Republic ship Torch, the far side of the Earth's moon, one week after Pulse. Today, we are going to take a step. A step which I personally think is about as risky as jumping into the mouth of an active volcano without a parachute. But a step. We are going to investigate potential aliens, folks. The real deal. We're going to ride into space on a pillar of the most metal ever sent into orbit at one point in time. As your captain, it is my job to keep you safe. We're going to potentially have our first face-to-face -face contact with another sapient being. And you should be excited. We're riding a candle made out of burning 10,000 tons of TNT every second. We'll be the first humans to go past the orbital distance of Pluto, and I do not want us to be the first humans to die past the orbit of Pluto. This journey will take five months to intercept the alien ship, and five months to decelerate to get back to the moon. We have three main objectives. One, make physical contact and determine friendliness. Two, if friendly, establish a means of communication. Three, if hostile, we defend the solar system, determine their technology level, and attempt to reverse engineer their FTL technology. We launch in ten minutes. The bridge was buzzing with excitement and no small amount of horrified, what have I done to get here, expressions. A circular view screen covered the sides of the bridge using a ring of cameras on the outside, with spliced videos to provide the ultimate panoramic video of riding a series of nuclear explosions into space. On the floor was a camera which was looking directly down the nuke's gun barrel to take a video of the launch process. Captain William Robert Monger knew that this was going to be a blast. Lift off in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeehaw! Fire in the hole! The ship shuddered under the sudden acceleration. The entire view screen went white as the reflected light off the moon's surface blinded the cameras. The launch camera caught a glimpse of red-hot lunar regolith being converted into volcanic glass right before the blast shield closed, 
and another shudder was felt as the pusher plate bottomed out. There was a moment of silence and zero gravity as the ship stopped accelerating. Captain William yelled at the plate engineer, Carl, increase the piston stiffness. We don't want to get rattled to death. Carl winced a bit. Yes, sir. We should be good. I've also increased the damping so it doesn't slam back to top dead center as fast. We might need a few more blasts to tune it properly, though. William sighed. Let's keep her on the safe side for now. We can handle a few extra Gs, but the ship can't handle the piston bottoming out constantly. Start it back up when it's ready. Carl engaged the engine once more. The initial shudder occurred once more, but the bone-crunching slam of the pusher plate impacting the ship didn't return. It was replaced by a strange waving sensation, as the ship constantly went between 2 and 2.2 G-forces every time a nuke went off. A new voice called out, Ugh, I think I'm gonna be seasick. Does anyone have uh, nidramamine or the equivalent? William responded. Yeah, actually, hey, Igor, can you get Dave some motion sickness pills? And make sure to go distribute some around the crew. I have a feeling you're not alone in your suffering, Dave. Walk carefully. We're going to have to burn hard for about 30 minutes to clear the Earth's gravity well before we start our main burn. We're safe here due to the Earth being on the moon's shadow, but I really don't feel like accidentally EMPing a thousand satellites in low Earth orbit. The communication station beeped. Dave looked at it with slightly less nausea than the previous minute. That's strange. We're getting packets from somewhere. We don't have a line of sight to any communication satellites nearby. No information, just bursts of signals. Two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen. My god, they're prime numbers!